are approximately 225,000 men diagnosed with prostate cancer in the U.S. in 2015. This means that there are 3 million men who are living with prostate cancer. That number, to put it into perspective, translates into one in six men being diagnosed with prostate cancer in their lifetime, and actually into one in 36 men who will die of prostate cancer. The epidemiology of prostate cancer has actually changed significantly over the last 25 years, particularly in relation to the stage of men at diagnosis. Before the PSA era, many men were diagnosed in late stages of prostate cancer. Since the 1980s, stages have essentially migrated such that 90% of men who are diagnosed are diagnosed when cancer is still localized in the prostate. Certainly screening can lead to earlier prostate cancer detection and with earlier detection you're eligible for multiple different treatments or active surveillance. So we encourage patients who are candidates for screening to discuss it with their urologist and or primary care physician um, so that we can uh, determine what's the best course of treatment for them. Patients who are candidates for screening are generally younger, healthier patients. Uh, there, there is some controversy as to what patients uh, benefit most from screening, but anyone who's got at least a 10 to 15 year life expectancy and is fairly healthy, active, is, is a candidate for screening. Uh, and also in particular, patients who have history, family history of prostate cancer uh, or African, African American patients. Screening for prostate cancer is fairly straightforward. It involves a blood test called a PSA, or prostate-specific antigen, as well as a digital rectal examination, which is an examination performed by the urologist. The new biomarkers and the genomic tests are not here to replace PSA, but uh, they are here to be added to the diagnostic workup. If the patient had uh, a negative uh, prostate biopsy and uh, we still feel that he is at risk of having prostate cancer, uh, there are two uh, urine tests that can be used uh, in the diagnostic workup. Uh, one is the PCA3, also another promising test, is called RNA exosome. The tissue-based tests like uh, Prolaris uh, and the Oncotype DX uh, would be uh, a good alternative and uh, would add information. A cipher uh, can be used now uh, for the prostate uh, uh, biopsy samples. Prostate biopsy, we perform MRI transfusion biopsy. That means we perform a magnetic resonance, uh, resonance image which is the MRI, and truss, which is the transrectal ultrasound uh, biopsy. So with this, we have the data from the MRI, and then we fuse this data with the ultrasound, and then we perform biopsy. The main benefits performing MRI truss fusion biopsy is that patients considering treatment for prostate cancer, they should have a accurate uh, diagnosis. That means we should minimize the possible errors and optimize the diagnosis in such a way that the patient can, take, can make a proper decision on, uh, in regards to his treatment. Quite often, patients come to USC who have had a negative biopsy, but their PSA is still high. In this case, we will perform MRI of the prostate, identify what spot within the prostate is concerning for cancer and then perform the MR ultrasound image fusion biopsy that is targeted specifically to the area of concern. The goal here, of course, is to identify any clinically significant prostate cancer. USC Institute of Urology is at the very cutting edge of this field. Our uh, surgeons and our researchers have published multiple papers in this regard. Our experience with MRI ultrasound biopsies now exceeds 500 patients. And our ability to accurately put the needle in the prostate exactly 
where we want to go and then be able to record that image so that we can revisit that location later down in multiple years when needed uh, is again uh, a unique aspect. After diagnosis of prostate cancer, the first question is, um, should we treat this cancer? Because if we live long enough, all of us would develop prostate cancer. Uh, so what we call it the risk stratification of prostate cancer is very important. Based on the rectal exam that your doctor does for you, your PSA, which is prostate-specific antigen, and the Gleason score on the biopsy of your prostate we stratify your cancer into very low risk, low risk, intermediate, and high risk prostate. Very low risk and low risk prostate cancers are the areas that nowadays we also offer genetic based biomarkers to delineate and stratify their risk a little bit more precisely, whether they are truly silent cancers and they're not gonna do anything to you or they're gonna be really bad cancer that needs attention. As a patient with prostate cancer, your options depend on the stage at which your prostate cancer is diagnosed. If you have localized prostate cancer, you have five treatment options. Number one, active surveillance. Active surveillance means that you do not receive any active intervention in the form of surgery or radiation or image-guided ablation. In active surveillance, what is done is uh, patients have a serial PSA, which is prostate-specific antigen, and a digital rectal exam every three to six months and a repeat prostate biopsy in about 12 to 18 months. Before patients are placed on active surveillance, it is very important that uh, one assesses the quality of the biopsy that has been done. Because if the biopsy is not of a good quality, you can underestimate cancer in about 30 to 50% of patients. And in fact, some experts would say that uh, one should repeat a prostate biopsy before actually putting a patient on active surveillance. Now, who's the ideal candidate for active surveillance? The ideal candidate for active surveillance is a person who has very low-risk prostate cancer or even low-risk prostate cancer in those patients who have significant comorbidities and limited life expectancy. Some intermediate-risk prostate cancers may also qualify for active surveillance, but the vast majority of intermediate-risk prostate cancer require a definitive treatment option. Uh, the number two option uh, for a patient with localized prostate cancer is uh, surgery. The vast majority of surgeries for prostate cancer today in the United States are robotic radical prostatectomies. These are basically uh, removal of the prostate and in some cases removal of the lymph nodes. Uh, the lymph node dissection is performed if the risk of having lymph node metastases are between 2 and 5%. Whenever, uh, whenever it is necessary to do a lymph node dissection, the recommendation is to do an extended lymph node dissection. The third treatment option for localized prostate cancer is uh, radiation. Radiation can be either brachytherapy, which is implantation of seeds into the prostate, or it can be external beam radiation, which uh, includes intensity modulated radiation therapy. Now, who are the candidates who are uh, good candidates for radiation? These are usually patients who have uh, intermediate risk or high-risk prostate cancer, who are either unfit for surgery or who decide not to go in for a surgical option. The fourth option is cryotherapy, uh, which basically means in the operating room, under general anesthesia, the surgeon will insert probes into the prostate and freeze the prostate. Uh, what cryotherapy does is it destroys or ablates the prostate tissue in place. So the prostate is not removed, just that the prostate tissue is frozen and therefore destroyed. And the fifth option is HIFU or high intensity focused ultrasound. As opposed to cryotherapy where the prostate is frozen, in high intensity focused ultrasound the prostate is heated by focusing ultrasound beams onto the prostate. This is again done under general anesthesia in the operating room and uh, with a rectal probe you uh, focus ultrasound beams onto the prostate and heat it to an extent that the prostate tissue is destroyed. Now keep in mind both cryotherapy and HIFU are currently approved in the US for ablation of prostate tissue and are not labeled specifically for the treatment of prostate cancer. So these are the five options for localized prostate cancer. High risk is typically anything higher than Gleason 7. That means Gleason 8, 9, or 10. 
Until recently, high-risk prostate cancer typically was not treated with surgery. But more recent research indicates that patients with high-risk Gleason 8, 9, or very high-risk Gleason 10 disease that has uh, gotten outside the prostate just locally uh, infiltrated the capsule can be and should be offered the option of undergoing removal of the prostate in preparation for hormonal treatment, chemotherapy, etc. Bottom line, a multidisciplinary approach is needed for patients with high risk and very high risk disease. And now this multidisciplinary approach also includes um, robotic prostatectomy with extended lymph node dissection such that we remove all the lymph nodes in the area as well in an effort to eliminate all visible disease. The final pathology after radical prostatectomy provides essential information about the prognosis of the disease. Prostate cancer, it's uh, graded in a scale from six to 10. That's uh, called Gleason score. And as it go higher, it's uh, more aggressive, the cancer. And the idea is to know exactly if the tumor is in one side or two sides of the prostate, because most of the biopsies before the surgery, the tumor is unilateral. But after the surgery, in 70% of the cases, we found that it's bilateral disease. Also, it's important to know the size of the disease, but it's more important to know if the tumor is in contact with the surface. If it's in contact to the surface, it means that at the age where we cut it, it can remain some tumor in the patient. And of course, according to the grade of the disease, not only it can change from one side to bilateral, also can change the, uh, the score of the grade of the cancer. We want to know if that tumor is in contact with the surface of the prostate or is inside of the prostate. We want to know if the tumor is in one side or is in both sides. We want to know if the tumor is in, in making invasion to the seminal vesicles. We want to know also if the tumor is going and affecting the bladder neck. According to those results, we will plan and will advise the patient if he will need additional treatment. When we talk about outcomes after prostate cancer surgery, there's three outcomes that we care about. One is, do we get rid of the cancer? The second one is, are men able to have good urine control without having leakage of urine? And the third most important outcome uh, is their ability to maintain erections and maintain um, their sexual function after surgery. Surgical outcomes for their prostate cancer starts with planning prior to surgery, and uh, the surgeons here are among the, among the most experienced, and so they are able to advise patients who come here as to which procedure um, or what approach would be best for them. In addition to that, the next step is excellent surgical care, and that is based on experience, and again, you know, the, the surgeons at USC are among, among the most experienced in the world taking care of prostate cancer. This translates to more precise surgery, um, and more exact removal of the cancer, make, making it much less likely that the cancer will come back. After surgery, uh, we additionally have a, a very experienced team. In addition to the urologist, there's oncologists and uh, radiation oncologists at, at the Norris Cancer Center, one of the leading cancer centers in the world. And in those men who have more serious cancer, we have a whole team approach to make sure that uh, every treatment that's necessary is offered to the men. Thank you.